Amen. It's a good day to be in the house of the Lord, dwelling together with the family of God. I hope you're doing well. Why don't you quickly, those of you in the room, greet our online campus that's with us right now. Hey, online, wherever you are in the world, we say thank you, and I'm excited that you've joined with us. And hey, one more time for our Durant campus. Why don't you give it up for them? Thank you so much, Durant, for joining us. It's so exciting to be a part of a a healthy, vibrant church spread out all over the world because we are united by more than geography or culture. We are united by the Spirit of God and the Word of God. So that's what we're dwelling in today. I'm going to pray. We're going to dive into Luke chapter 1, continue the series that we have for this Advent season. Why don't you bow your heads with me? Father, we love you. And we are so grateful, so grateful for what you've done in Christ Jesus and what you are doing by the Holy Spirit, in and through our lives. Today, may we have eyes to see and ears to hear. May we connect in a deeper way with the living word, Jesus. May we see Jesus and be transformed by Jesus through his Holy Spirit. So Holy Spirit, across the world, whoever's joining us right now, open our ears to hear, to receive the word which is able to save our souls, which is able to Bring salvation into our lives. May we participate in more than a holiday season. May we participate in your story. May we be awake and aware of your story. And be willing, surrendered participants in it. And I pray that as I speak, I speak clearly the word of God. And that lives are transformed today. And we thank you for this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. We are in more than a holiday season. You've got to get in that. Uh, If I could get anything across to you, we are in more than a holiday season. We are in a sacred season. Sacred, sanctified time. Time set apart to be attentive and awake, and the world around us is trying to drown out the voice of God, trying to clutter your life from awareness and attention to what God is doing, and trying to force us to be just consumers who are nothing more than buyers, We do not need to engage in that kind of season. We need to engage in the kind of season that makes us aware of God's presence. Aware that there is more going on than me in my life. There is God in his life, his story that he's inviting us into. And so we started last week a series for the season of Advent. And I've entitled it Recapturing Wonder and Mystery. Because, man... The world is, is trying to just dumb things down for you in the Christian world, sometimes in an effort to oppose an onslaught of secularism, just turns into cheesy, kitsch junk and has no real awake or awareness. And we've lost a sense of wonder, childlike wonder. We, we tend to try to create these moments for our kids, but we've lost something in our day and age that I want to recapture, I want to bring back wonder and mystery that there is more going on than often we are aware of, that there is mystery in the world. We are not people who have it all figured out. And the, the temptation, and I express to you my temptation, my temptation in an effort to try to resist secular culture was just to become a cynic, just to become critical of the world around me. And start to shut myself off to that. But I was also shutting myself off to the work of God and the story of God. That the world around me is trying to convince me and it's trying to convince you that you are the center of your own universe. You're the main character in your own story. There is no big story so you might as well do what you can to live a good life and to have fun while you're doing it. But ultimately there's no real purpose. The world around you is structured to try to convince you of that. And I want to do everything I can to convince you convince you by the Spirit of God that God is at work. He has a story and He can weave us into that story. That we are more than just consumers. We are participants in God's story. We are not the main character. God is the main character. And Advent takes a season and it it demands that we focus on more than self, what I want and what I need. More than just a cluttered schedule and traveling. There's more going on. And that's the season that we're in that we are intended to focus on and see what God is doing. So last week we talked to Zechariah and Elizabeth and that there is reason to hope. There's so much despair in the world. There's so much wrong. 
in the world. And our temptation is to just despair, to give up hope. And we looked at the, the Jewish people, spent centuries just waiting and hoping and waiting and hoping. And we see that God began to be at work in people who were long past able to, to have a child. And he creates a miracle in their life. And that shows us that we have reason to hold on to hope. We have reason to hope. We don't have to be in despair. This week, I, w- I want to maybe take that same thing, but turn just a little bit and look at the same thing, maybe from a little bit of a different angle. The cynic in me uh, that I have to resist and sort of uh, allow the spirit to push that back. But the cynic in me looks at our world, um, all of the news in the world, all that goes on in the world. And, and I'm tempted to just be a cynic to all of that and just say, what's the use? This world is ran by what I would maybe call big people, big companies, large industries, big governments, the elite, the, this aristocracy that, that is this in the shadows, a small group of people that just runs everything, and the little guy just gets ignored, or maybe even worse, gets silenced, pushed aside, and the whole world is trying to show you that you cannot make a difference. You are too small. You are not big enough. You are not important enough. And so the only hope you have is to maybe just distract yourself from the real misery, try to give yourself somewhat of a good time while you're living, or do everything you can to become one of those big people. Acquire lots of wealth, uh, acquire power, pursue um, things that give you notoriety and power. And oftentimes we just don't want to give that kind of effort, so we just end up with the other ditch. Just, Just despair, cynicism, and criticism, and Okay, we love Jesus, so maybe there'll be a good afterlife, but in the meantime, we'll just hopefully just get by. <laughs> and, and it would be very easy to, to sort of give in to that kind of despair and cynicism, because really, I mean, if you, if you just think about our world, how big it is and how big the problems are, really, can we really make a difference? And what really is going on in the world, and can we do anything about it? Or is it just destined, as so many people think, it's just destined for destruction, and sadly, the church sometimes gets excited about that, gets excited about the destruction of the world, and that's a terrible, terrible posture. And again, the story of Advent forces us to not give in to that. It forces us to see that God is at work, and not just at work in big people, those who have wealth or power or notoriety. But he actually pays very close attention to maybe the little guy, to the nobody in nowhere. And so part of the context of this story is that for centuries, you know, Israel went off into exile to Babylon. And even after they came back, they they started to try to hold on to all of their hopes and all of those promises that the prophets had been telling them that there's going to come a savior. All the way from the very beginning in Genesis 3, there was a promise that there's going to be this seed of woman that's going to crush the head of the serpent. There's going to be a deliverer who's going to come from the tribe of Judah, an anointed king, a Messiah from the family of David that's going to come and bring deliverance. And he's going to set his people free, deliver them from their enemies, and there's going to be peace and shalom. And they, they try to reawaken all of those hopes And and centuries go by and nothing seems to be happening. We looked last week at, out of nowhere, this elderly couple gets invited into the story. But now we want to look at a different couple characters to see really who God pays most attention to and who God completely overlooks, which is such a great thing to think about. Luke chapter 1, again, we'll be in Luke chapter 1. We'll just go through the story and I'll just show you some of the things that are there. And hopefully you'll see that there is reason to hope and there is reason for us to be faithful to the living God. For us to trust that God is at work and he can bring us into his story. Luke chapter 1 verse 26. In the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, which we looked at last week, God sent the angel Gabriel to the Galilean village of Nazareth to a virgin engaged to be married to a man descended from David. His name was Joseph and the virgin's name was Mary. Let's just pause there for a second. And, and see all that's going on here. Galilee was this region uh, north of Israel, or north of Jerusalem. It was in an area of the country that had been overrun many times, and it was just basically this desolate region. It was, it was nowhere. 
It really was nowhere. And Nazareth was a podunk nothing of a village in the middle of nowhere. So in the world of power politics, where all the real action was going on in Rome at this time, and then if Israel had anything to do with God that they wanted to participate, it, was, it had to be at the center of action in Jerusalem. And see, what you got to know about Jerusalem at that time is that for centuries it had been under different occupying powers. Foreign military powers had overran Jerusalem time and time again. And at this time, it was under the rule of Rome. And, and the only real thing you could do if you wanted to get anywhere, is you basically had to collude and conspire with Rome. And so there were many people, the Herodians. You, you've heard of Herod, Herod the Great or King Herod. He was a pawn of Rome who had all sorts of wealth and notoriety. He was famous and powerful. And, and it was because he had to conspire with Rome and he was just a pawn and a puppet of Rome. Or the tax collectors. Those are people who could acquire lots of wealth if they just gave in, uh, gave in to the powers that be and just worked with them so that they would get ahead in the world. And so those are the people that are running the world at this time. And they're running the world at the center of these major cities, the center of action where all the famous and powerful and wealthy people are. And God isn't anywhere near that. We find God at work in a podunk village off to the north, almost literally the middle of nowhere. It says, to a virgin betrothed to be married or engaged to be married. Often, um, young Jewish women, sometime between 13 and 16, would be betrothed to a man who's a little bit older, who would be working to acquire some wealth and maybe some land and a little bit of stability, and then that, that engaged woman would be given to that man. So we're talking about a poor woman who was not seen, we'll just say it, women were not seen as very high social figures in that world. You know, that, that's maybe the nicest way of saying, of saying it. They, 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 were, they were slightly above slave. Basically, mostly treated as property, generally speaking. Their, their value was to give men sons. That might be a little caricature of that, but that's a lot of what was going on at that time. So that, this teenage, poor girl, is who God appears to. A nobody in the middle of nowhere is exactly what God was looking for to bring into his story. That just excites me, that I don't have to be this big person in the world to be participant in God's story. Okay, the next verse. It goes on, upon entering, Gabriel greeted her. Good morning. You're beautiful with God's beauty. Beautiful inside and out. God be with you. Such an interesting greeting. You, maybe the more official, greetings, O oh, favored one. That's a little too formal. I imagine that Gabriel was a little more common in his language with her. He says, you're beautiful or favored. You're beautiful with God's beauty. So, so this nobody in the middle of nowhere, God seems to single out and calls her beautiful. So what exactly would God be seeing if he identified her as beautiful? Especially, it says, inside and out. So he's not talking about some stature on the outside that from the looks of her from the outside, we think, oh, wow, that is a very gorgeous lady. We, maybe, but is that what God's looking for? Is that what God was looking for when he's looking for someone to bring into especially such a crucial part of his story? No, just to go back, you know, just the verse before it, it said that it came from the line of David. So let's look at, look at one of the, the things that happened in David's life. 1 Samuel chapter 16, verse 7. This is where Samuel, uh, the prophet Samuel, goes to the house of Jesse and is looking to anoint the next king. God had selected a king from his family. And so Jesse brings out seven of his eight sons because he thinks, he thinks his eighth son there's no way this guy's going to get selected. So he shows him the first son, Eliab. 
And he thinks, this, guy, this guy's got it going on. And Samuel's like, yeah, I can see a king in this guy. And this is what God says to Samuel. Do not look on his appearance. Don't look at his appearance or the height of his stature. Now, there, he's talking about physical stature, but I want you to look for a second. God's not looking at your stature of wealth. How much money is in the bank for you? He's not looking at your social stature. You know, the people that you are above. He's not looking at social structures like we look at social structures. Nothing on the outside. He says, no, for the Lord sees not as man sees. He's not looking at the same things we look at. Man looks on the outward appearance, but the Lord, Yahweh, looks on the heart. That's what God was looking for. A few centuries later, God is speaking to one of, the prophet is speaking to one of David's descendants, a king, King Asa, and he says this in 2 Chronicles 16, verse 9. For the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth. God is looking. You need to remember that. God is looking. He's looking to give strong support, not to the powerful, maybe, not necessarily to the wealthy, not to the famous. He gives strong support to those whose heart is blameless. Not perfect in the sense of sinless, but blameless. A pure heart. A heart towards Him. So when God is looking for someone, He's not necessarily looking at the center of action where man looks at. Big cities, famous circles, you know, certain social circles. That you, he's not, he, he's, he might be looking there, but he's, that's not what He's looking at. What He's looking for is a heart. And that's what He saw in Mary. In the middle of nowhere, a nobody had a heart for God. And so then, he, he, it says in verse 29 of Luke chapter 1, Luke chapter 1, verse 29, she was thoroughly shaken, wondering what was behind a greeting like that. I mean, I would imagine so. If an angel came up and said, you're beautiful, you're like, okay, this is, this is a little weird. And he says, Mary, you have nothing to fear. Just, just, we heard it in our readings in Psalm 37. He says, don't be afraid. Don't, don't, don't fret about the people who seem to prosper in their own plans. Don't worry about the people who get all rich and famous because of their own arrogance and pride. Don't fret that. It said in, in, in verse 10 or verse 9 that soon they'll go away. Soon they'll be cut off. But those who wait for the Lord shall inherit the land. Those who are meek shall inherit the earth. That's what God's looking for. He says, don't, be, don't, worry. don't worry, Mary. Don't be afraid. God has a surprise for you. You will become pregnant and give birth to a son. And call his name Jesus. And look at this. He will be great. He'll be called son of the highest. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David. Remember that. The throne of his father David. He will rule Jacob's house forever. No end ever to his kingdom. So you have, you have to remember those who were holding out hope. That God would come back to Israel. That God would remember his promises what kinds of promises were they holding on to? What kinds of hopes were they nursing? One of them is in Isaiah chapter 9. Isaiah chapter 9 verse 6 says this. For to us a child is born. To us a son. He will give you a son. You'll name him Jesus. To us a son is given. And the government shall be upon his shoulder. And his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor. Mighty God. Everlasting Father. Prince of Shalom, Prince of Peace. Verse 7 says this, Of the increase of his government and of peace, there will be no end. On the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and to uphold it with justice and with righteousness, not with corruption and deception. Because the powers that be seem to work by deception or corruption. Right? Right? That, that, that's what it seems that goes on all the time. And who are we to be able to fight against such power, such corruption? How are we supposed to fight against that? Well, do you not think they felt the same thing? Corrupt kings who perverted justice. 
There was no justice or righteousness in the land. And so they're trying to hold out hope, but all that they saw was corruption. And so what they were nursing is that God held out this promise for them, this hope that there would be a righteous king come. And that when he comes, he will bring justice. He will bring the scales of justice to their equitable end. He will be righteous. He won't be full of corruption. He'll be righteous. He will do something about the corruption. And then, it, it will, not just for a little bit, but forever. From this time forth and forevermore. You don't have to do this. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. But listen. Hundreds of years go by from this promise. Hundreds. This was written roughly 600 years before Jesus. And so 600 years later, the angel, Gabriel, gets to show up to a nobody in the middle of nowhere and say, you, you, remember, you remember that promise that there's going to be a king coming and he's going to be just and he's going to bring righteousness and when he takes the throne, it will never end. That's going to be the baby that's on the inside of you. I want to show you something that part of the reason why they nursed this hope wasn't just about the king. It's in the first line of this, of this part of the verse. Of the increase of his government, his kingdom, his structures, and of peace, there will be no end. Peace, we often think of in uh, feeling good. And in maybe some senses, in a larger sense, sometimes we look at peace as not in war. And that's a lot of times how we see peace. You need to know that peace was more than those things to a Jew. The Hebrew word for peace is called shalom. And shalom became this one word summation of all the hopes that they had that the world would be set right. Peace had this, it, one of the literal meanings of that word shalom is completeness or wholeness. You could think of when your body is in shalom, it is healthy and whole. It's not that it's just not sick, it's that it's healthy and whole. When a relationship experiences shalom, it's not just that those two people aren't fighting anymore. I mean, you've been there if you're married. You've been at a place where you're not fighting, but there's not necessarily shalom in the house. Yeah. Okay, yeah. Well, I mean, I think you got that one. So there's this, there was this hope that it wouldn't just be that our nation wouldn't be at war anymore. Yes, that would be part of the hope. But that things would be right. Our nation would be whole. Our people would get along. There would be health in our bodies. Our relationships would get along. There wouldn't be injustice from neighbor to neighbor. That it wouldn't be the wealthy elite oppressing the poor. That things would be right. And so part of that promise is that there will be a king coming that won't just ascend the throne and bring a little bit of justice and keep the nation from getting at war. There would be a king who would come who would bring shalom and that shalom would keep increasing and increasing and it would never end. That those were the hopes that the people of God were nursing through the centuries of despair and oppression. We are a little impatient, you know? We, we tend to try to force God into our own timelines. And He doesn't accommodate us very well. So we maybe should chill out and actually stand on His promise. But listen, so when Gabriel starts talking to, to Mary and he says... The throne of his father David and his kingdom will have no end. He's saying, what you've been waiting for for six centuries is about to be unleashed onto the world. His government. Not, not, not that Herod that is, that is corrupt, that is perverse, that is allowing... Not that guy's being ignored. The real king is coming and it's to you who's a nobody in the middle of nowhere. That's who God's looking. He's looking for that kind of heart to bring that kind of government and peace to. That's who he's looking for. 
And then Mary has what should probably be considered a reasonable response. Mary said to the angel, but how? I've never slept with a man. So to kind of compare and contrast, (laughs) I'm not going there. Get your mind out of the gutter. So Zechariah asked the question, how to, right? But, but if, if you're looking for the tone, I might be filling the gaps just a little bit, but, but there's a reason why there's two completely different reactions from Gabriel. Zechariah comes across to me like a hardened older man who's been holding out for hope for decades, but got continually disappointed, and now... Even an angel is trying to resurrect some hopes, and there's just this kind of hardened cynicism. I've been here before. How is that going to happen? Whereas his is more of an elderly hardened cynicism, Mary's question comes from maybe childlike wonder. Okay, how's this going to happen? I mean, because there's kind of impossible odds. There kind of is no such thing. As a virgin birth. So, okay, great. How? How is this going to happen? Verse 35, the angel said, The Holy Spirit will come upon you. The power of the highest hover over you. Therefore, the child you bring to birth will be called Holy Son of God. So much in there, we just got to keep moving. And did you know? Did you, in, ca- in case you're still wondering how this is going to happen, in case you didn't know that your cousin Elizabeth conceived a son, old as she is, everyone called her barren, and here she is, six months pregnant. Nothing you see is impossible for God. Amen. Nothing is impossible for God. I mean, in your Bible, you need to just highlight verse 37. Nothing is impossible for God. Now, granted, it's like not going to happen that there's another, another virgin birth, okay? We'll get that. But you need to see that when God is going to fulfill his promises, he's not that concerned with impossible circumstances. Those impo- what we perceive to be impossible does not seem to be a hindrance to God's promises, And it's important to note right here when you say nothing is impossible for God. God is committed to fulfill His promises in spite of impossible odds. Okay? Now you might be facing impossible odds. Everything is not impossible for you. You and I are kind of bound. Pretty pretty small to a really small universe. Like, like... Go out in space and take off your suit. We'll see, we'll see how fragile you and I are. Yeah? I mean, like, hold your breath for like six minutes. Don't drink water for three days. We're pretty fragile and we're facing impossible odds in a lot of things. Right? Because, I mean, for us, we have a lot of impossible. Our world is pretty small for what, what is possible and impossible for us. And so sometimes when we try to take a verse like that, nothing is impossible for God, that we get ourselves into all sorts of problems and situations and go, oh God, please get us out. Now God is merciful and oftentimes he does get us out of impossible odds. But it's important to note that you and I cannot strong arm God to get him to do what we want him to do and on our terms. God is committed to his word. He's committed to his promises And if he has made a promise, when you and I surrender to that and we stand in faith and believe him, there is nothing that will be impossible for him to bring that promise to fulfillment. So it's important to note, what are we standing on in the midst of impossible odds? Are we standing on God's promises or are we standing on our carnal desires? We have to have a moment of self-awareness when we're understanding these things because it should ignite faith but a particular kind of faith. Faith in God, His character, His word, and His promises. That's what we stand in faith for. Not try to get Him to do what we want Him to do, when we want Him to do it, how we want Him to do it. He doesn't accommodate those, that kind of pride very well. To put it, to put it lightly. And, and then look at Mary's response. Look at Mary's response. The next 
first. This is so important right here. Yes, I see it all now. I'm the Lord's maid, ready to serve. Let it be with me, just as you say. Let it be with me, just as you say. The ESV of that verse says this, maybe a little more familiar language. Behold, I am the servant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. Get into the moment right here, okay? A little bit. We, we tend to separate ourselves from the story. Get into the story just for a second here. This is a teenage girl who is engaged to be married. So as a teenage girl engaged to be married, I'm sure she's doing her best to try to figure out her future. What kind of future will I have? What kind of life can me and my betrothed husband build together? And the, the angel invades that space and says, whatever your plans have been, here's a promise. And you need to know the cost of that promise. We see all of this with thousands of years distancing ourselves from that story. Put yourself in that moment. Your plans are over. If you're going to participate in this promise, you don't have an agenda anymore. This will change your life. This will change your plans. Now, hopefully we know enough of Scripture that would say, well, okay, God's plans are better than my plans, higher than my plans. His thoughts are higher and better than my thoughts. And so, but I want you to think that when it comes to receiving God's promises, often it comes at a cost. And I do not mean the kind of cost to earn it. That's works. That is not, that is not what I'm talking about. That violate grace. What I'm talking about is sometimes for us to participate in God's plans, we have to surrender our plans. Delight ourselves in the Lord. He gives us the desires of our heart. Trust in Him and He will bring it to pass. Psalm 37, 4 and 5. Mary's world got turned upside down right here. She had to make a choice. Will I hold on to my plans and my agenda or will I give in to God's plan and His promises? And I mean, I don't know if you know this, what I hear, pregnancy is not easy. That's kind of an assumption on my part. I've heard it from, you know, reliable sources. I, the way I understand, I was present for four childbirths. I, it's not that easy. And I mean, I was there for four of them, so I, I, I have enough credibility, I think, to say that it's... But I'm sure there's more reliable sources out there that could say childbirth is not easy, right? So in the very least, this promise includes that kind of pain. Not to mention this idea that if he's going to be that kind of king... There's also these prophecies from Isaiah 53 that he would be a man of sorrows. And that he would be rejected. And you would have to witness your son being rejected. She didn't really have an imagination of the cross at that point. But she did understand that this is going to cost her something. And you and I get the same choice when it comes to our lives, our stories, and our agendas. Are we going to align ourselves with God's promises... And his plans, are we, like Mary, are we the servant of the Lord or are we self-serving? Her response is so important for us understanding how we receive the word of God. How we receive the promises of God. I'm the servant of the Lord. In, in a word, surrender. Are, will you and I be willing to surrender when it comes to bringing about the fulfillment of God's promises? Will we surrender our timelines that we have so carefully crafted for God to just put a check mark on, right? That's my tendency anyway. Here, God, I've got this all worked out. I've got a great plan. I just need you to execute on time. <laughs> yeah, he didn't, he didn't seem to appreciate that like I do, but... 
You, so you got to think, are we going to be a servant of the Lord or are we going to be self-serving? And then what, what are we standing on when it comes to walking in the promises? Let it be to me according to your word. Am I willing to give up my hopes and dreams for his word to be made manifest in and through me? Am I going to be willing to walk through the frustrating pregnancy pains of his word growing on the inside of me? Bearing fruit is what the New Testament Jesus talks about in John 15. That we abide in him and his word abides in us and we bear fruit. Are we willing to go through those pregnancy pains and birthing pains for the word of God to come manifest in our life? Or are we so committed to convenience and comfort that we'd just rather God do what we want him to do? So what's our response going to be? Same goes for Joseph. We don't have time, but you can look in Matthew chapter 1, verses 18 to 25. It's the story. It kind of looks at the same situation from Joseph's angle. He had an agenda too. He had plans for his life. He had plans for his family, his marriage, what he was going to do and how he was going to do it. And when he found out that Mary was pregnant, do you not think you would feel a little betrayed? And how's he supposed to know that that was the Holy Spirit? It took a dream. So he felt betrayed, and then now he's in a dream, which, I mean, if I'm thinking about my own dreams, my dreams aren't super trustworthy. So, like, he had to believe God based on a dream. And, he's, and, and you know what? It says that after he woke up from his dream, he got up and did exactly what the angel said. So he had to have a moment of faith, too. So faith... Which is what he's at. A heart of faith is also a heart of surrender. You can't have faith and also always get your way. Sorry. Faith is not what you have to do to acquire something from God. Faith is an orientation of our life around God. His word, his character, his promises, his plans, his activity, his story. So faith is to humbly surrender our plans and agendas to him. That's faith. Okay, so the story continues. Luke 1, 39. Mary didn't waste a minute. She got up and traveled to a town in Judah in the hill country straight to Zechariah's house and greeted Elizabeth. When Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, the baby in her womb leaped. She was filled with the Holy Spirit and sang out exuberantly, you're so blessed among women and the babe in your womb also blessed. And why am I so blessed that the mother of my Lord visits me? The moment the sound of your greeting entered my ears, the babe in my womb skipped like a lamb for sheer joy. Blessed woman who believed, here it is, faith, who believed what God said, believed every word would come true. Believed. So listen, just on a side note, don't get around people who's going to try to abort the baby on the inside of you, okay? Don't get around people who are going to abort God's word. Get around people that the, 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 the word in their womb leaps for joy. Get around people who encourage you. Okay, keep, keep moving before we get taken away by the Holy Ghost. And so Mary responded, I'm bursting with God news. I'm dancing the song of my Savior God. God took one good look at me. And look what happened. I'm the most fortunate on the earth. God took one look at me. The ESV of Psalm or Luke 148 says this. For he has looked on the humble estate of his servant. So what I wanted you to get last session was that when the angel was talking to Zechariah, he says, don't be afraid. Your prayers have been heard. God hears our prayers, but also looks upon our heart, humble, and our conditions. Listen, you are not being ignored by God. Don't assume that you are. I know it might feel that way. I know you feel isolated and alone. I know you feel like there's nothing good going on. But I'm telling you, God is paying attention. He looked. Verse 48. What God has done for me will never be forgotten. The God whose, whose very name is holy, set apart from all others. His mercy flows in wave after wave on those who are in awe before him. So much there. Keep moving. He bared his arm and showed his strength. So what happens when God shows his strength? Scattered the bluffing braggarts. 
He knocked tyrants off their high horses. And he pulled the victims out of the mud. The starving poor sat down to a, bank, a banquet. The callous rich were left out in the cold. So what, what happens when God bears his strength? When his strength is revealed, the arrogant get pushed aside. All those big people that we think run the world, that we are powerless against, that we have no hope of fighting against, when God bears his strength and brings his promises to fruition, when the kingdom of God is manifested, the arrogant of the world just get pushed aside. And the ones who the arrogant have belittled and overlooked or even enslaved, those are the ones that God's like, "Mm, I'm bringing you out of the mud. I'm going to give you a rich old banquet. The new, the new Living of those verses says this. His mighty arm has done tremendous things. He scattered the proud and haughty ones. God is not looking at outward appearance. Remember, God's looking at the heart. So which heart conditions is God pushing aside? Pride and haughty or arrogant. Let's, take, let's just have a moment of self-awareness. Are we the proud and haughty ones? I'm, you might not be rich and famous, but is your heart still calloused and cynical and arrogant? Because it's those with those heart conditions that God's pushing aside, and look who he brings up. He brought down princes in their thrones. Those, those corrupt kings that you are so afraid of, God just moves them aside. He's not deterred by them at all. He doesn't even really care. Just get away. You're you're ruining everything. Just move aside. And he exalts the humble. That's from our reading. 1 Peter chapter 5. God opposes the proud, but he exalts the humble. And so he says, humble yourself. This is Peter. The apostle Peter is just beckoning us. Humble yourself before the mighty hand of God. And in due time, when the right time happens, he, not you, he will exalt you. That's what happens when God bears his holy arm. When he bears his strength. He takes the humble who've waited patiently. Who've trusted. Who've stood in faith. Not necessarily. You don't have to be angry social warriors to make a difference. He says, that's why the psalmist in Psalm 37 says, Don't get angry. Don't get angry about all this. And don't get yourself worked up in wrath. I'm telling you. The evil will be pushed aside soon enough. And those who've waited for the Lord, he will exalt. That's what he's talking about here. And Mary is prophesying it. She continues in verse 46. He embraced his chosen child, Israel. He remembered. God has a fantastic memory. He does not see time like you and I see time. We live in time. God has the ability to stand outside of time. What we perceive to be 600 years, God sees as a moment. So that's why our perception of time does not need to be projected onto God trying to force Him into our timelines. He's not going to conveniently fit into that. It's exactly what He promised. God, he, He remembers exactly what He has promised. Beginning with Abraham, right up until now. God sees you. He looks upon you. He sees your condition. But what he most sees is our hearts. When God acts, he exalts the humble and pushes aside the proud. And so we don't have to live in despair thinking, oh, we can, how, what difference can we make against such impossible odds? We don't have to get frustrated or in despair, or hopeless in the midst of difficult circumstances. Our circumstances have not altered God's character or His Word. He is not frustrated like you and I are frustrated. When we are frustrated, that should tell us something about our heart's condition. We're, we're, we're projecting our own expectations onto God. When what we need to do, the people who get to participate in the fulfillment of God's promises are the people who are humble. What that would mean in this story is those who are surrendered to His plans and purposes and who believe Him, who stand on His Word. Listen, you don't believe something because you say you believe it. A way of putting it, truths unlived 
are not truths at all. You believe something when you live as if it's true. That's how we know faith. It's not what's coming out of your mouth, though I would hope your words are words of faith. Your words still have power. But beyond your words, what is the posture of our heart that should be informing those words and shaping those words? Is our heart shaped around trusting God and believing His word to be true? Or are we trying to put it all on ourselves and hope that God does what we want Him to do? That He just put a stamp of approval on our plans and purposes. And so we, if we, 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 get, we get to participate in God's story. However, we can willfully choose to excuse ourselves from His story. We can be arrogant and prideful, and God's word will still come true, but through other people. And so no matter what we are up against, no matter how many times we look at our news feed and struggle with despair, no matter how many times we, we look at the conditions of our life and struggle with hopelessness, no matter how many conspiracy theories are out there that says it's this elite group that runs the world, even if it's true, we don't have to be angry and we don't have to be afraid. All we, all we are supposed to be is humble, surrendered, and in faith. And just like Mary and Joseph, we get to participate in the bringing forth of God's word into the world. Because I'm telling you, the increase of his government and of his shalom will have no end. We get to choose, are we going to oppose it by being in pride? Or are we going to be bringers of shalom? Are we going to be people of peace? People of peace must first be at peace. That starts with being at peace with God. Are we at peace with God? Okay, yes, your sins are forgiven, but have you been trying to force God into your own timelines? You're not in shalom when you're trying to get God to fit into your own agendas. We can be people of shalom. And it's not complicated, but it's also not easy. Are we going to stand in faith, believe his word to be true, and live it regardless of what we feel? Mary first believed she was pregnant. It says that she didn't waste any time. She took off to go visit her cousin. She didn't know if she was pregnant or not. But it wasn't until that moment where the baby leaped on the inside of Elizabeth that she says, whoa, there's something different about you. That's probably the first time Mary recognized, oh, it came true. We, we believe God's word to be true despite our feelings, despite our circumstances. We live surrendered to him, which is to not force him into our own timelines and our own agenda and plans. And are we humble? Are we, are we listening and submissive to him? That's what it's like to be a part of his story. And that's why when we get so busy and cluttered and frustrated and cynical in this season where everybody is trying to be cheery, but we're all faking it. Can we just push that cloud of fake aside and just be attentive to God, His work, His story, and actually... Go back into the story full of wonder and mystery. That we don't have all this figured out. We don't have God figured out in a nice little program. But we do get to be participants in his story. And we get to engage in the mystery. And we do that by faith and in humility. And that's our posture as the people of God. And that's part of why this table, the table of the Lord, is so important. Because we cannot come to this table in pride. We cannot come proud in our own selves because we bring nothing. Jesus gives everything at this table. Amen? So would you just bow your heads and close your eyes for a moment? Duran, if you would as well. Bow your heads, close your eyes. If you're joining us online, bow your heads, close your eyes just for a moment. Let's have a moment of awareness. Let's check our hearts. 
Have we been living in pride? Or have we been submissive? Have we been trying to force our own story, our own agenda, our own plans? Maybe even ignorantly. But let's have a moment of awareness right now. Are we living in humility? Are we living believing, in faith, believing God's word to be true? Are we living like we say we believe? Is that how we're living? And so Holy Spirit, open our hearts to see and to hear. Make us aware. Make us aware of your presence right now. You confront us in our pride, but you comfort us as well. And so right now, we as a church, we repent. We repent of, we repent of our pride. We turn. We turn back. We all, like sheep, have gone astray. We've done our own thing, gone our own way. But you, Jesus, have been the good shepherd. You have pursued us. And you have found us. And now you're bringing us home. May we be brought home today. May this be our home. In you, Lord Jesus. As we trust you. And as we come to your table, we come with humility. We've not earned your love. There's nothing we could do to deserve it. But we can receive it. And you give us your all. You gave your life. And you are the Prince of Peace. So right now, we bring you our impossible odds, our difficult and challenging circumstances. We bring that to you. There's nothing we can do to make it right. So we trust you. We submit to you. We yield to you. And so we say thank you. Because you receive you receive the junk of our lives and yet you still give your love and your grace. And so at this table, at this table, we humble ourselves and we just become a grateful people. A grateful people who are surrendered to you. We pray your kingdom come and your will be done in us in our lives and in our world as it is in heaven. May the increase of your government and of your shalom increase in our lives so that we could bring that increase into our world. Our world is so full of despair. It's so full of hate and anger. And in the flesh we see no way out of this. We see, we see no other option except to give up or be in despair or just get angry. And yet, God, you are king from of old and you are working salvation in the midst of the earth. You oppose the proud and you give grace to the humble. Your foolishness is wiser than the wisest plans of man. And you, you call the foolish... You call the poor. You call the ignorant. You call those who are of lower estate. And you empower them with your grace and with your wisdom. So that we can only boast in glory in you. We cannot boast in ourselves and so we only boast in you. May we receive your wisdom. May we receive your grace. And be willing vessels of your kingdom and of your shalom. So we thank you for this. We come humbly to your table. We thank you for your body that was broken. And your blood that was shed. So that we could be forgiven. So that we could be made whole. So that we can be participants in your story. So I thank you for that. If you just remain in an attitude of surrender and humility. Awake and attentive. Let me just explain what we're going to do in a moment in our Durant campus. You're going to come to the table of the Lord. And you're going to receive. Someone is going to give you the 
piece of bread and say, the body of the Lord broken for you. And I want you to hear it because it's for you. Someone will give you the cup and they'll say, the blood of the Lord Jesus shed for you. I want you to hear that. I want you to receive it for you. For those joining us online, now would be the time as we all in these campuses come to the table. We'd go get elements so that together, in Durant, online, and here in Sherman, together we would partake of the table of the Lord together. And so would you stand with me? If you're in Durant, stand with me and come to the table of the Lord to receive the body of the Lord broken for you and the blood of Christ shed for you. Come, everyone is welcome to the table of the Lord.